Carpenter. This is the August 19th meeting. We'll note that all commissioners are here. Are there any changes to the order of business? Hearing none, would there be a motion to approve the order of business? So moved. Is there a second? We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Motion carries. The next item then is the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda you wish uh, to discuss? Not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mrs. Dukart. Aye. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Mr. Oldman. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Chair votes aye. The motion carries. Uh, we'll go to tab four, the non-timetable agenda. And the first item we have there is to hear the financial report for July. And Mrs. Johnson will present that. Good evening, Mr. President, Commissioners. I'll highlight a few items from the financial report through July. We'll begin with the general fund report. With 58% of the year completed, our property taxes equal $3.3 million and were 97% collected compared to budget. Our other taxes and fees, which include financial institution tax and franchise fees, is $206,000 and is 85% collected compared to budget. Our intergovernmentals, which include revenues we receive from state and local governments, such as the highway distribution tax and the oil production tax, totals $2.1 million and is 52% collected compared to budget. Our licenses, fees, and services, which include building permit revenues, oil royalties, and admin fees, is 60% collected compared to budget. Our building permit revenue is up $394,000 compared to last year. This category also includes our municipal court fines, which are up $17,000 compared to last year. Our total general fund revenues equal $7.7 million through July, and were 57% collected compared to budget. In our general fund expenses, our general government, which includes administration, court, finance, and buildings and sites, is 62% collected, expended, excuse me, compared to budget. Our overage here is due mostly to timing. Our public safety, which includes police and fire, is 52% expended compared to budget. Our engineering and streets, which now includes community development, is 67% expended compared to budget. The overage here is due to plan reviews in our engineering department and also budgeted equipment purchases in our street department. Our cultural services, which includes museum and forestry, is 50% expended compared to budget. And our total general fund expenditures equals $7.9 million through July and were 58% expended compared to budget. In our enterprise funds, our water and wastewater revenues equal $4.9 million through July and were 67% collected compared to budget. And our expenses and capital outlays total $5.3 million, which is 73% expended compared to budget. Our overage here is due to bu budgeted capital outlays. And in our solid waste fund, our revenue is $2.6 million through July, which is 68% collected compared to budget. And our expenses and capital outlays total $1.5 million, which is 41% expended compared to budget. In our sales tax reports, we've received $808,000 of 1% revenue in July, which is up 4.6% for the year. Our 1% sales tax is broken down into three segments. The first is our 50% share. This is for street projects and infrastructure. In 2013, we are budgeting infrastructure, infrastructure projects totaling $850,000. The second is our 20% share, which is for job creation and senior programs. This segment funds Stark Development, Elder Care, and the RSVP subsidies, along with the Senior Citizen and the Southwest Regional Grant Programs. The expenses through July total $540,000. And the third is our 30% share, which is set aside for capital improvements. The items budgeted here include $50,000, which is a portion of our final BAC pledge payment. The remainder of that is in our hospitality tax. The animal shelter, our trails construction, and park and rec improvements. 
In our half percent sales tax, we received $404,000 of revenue in July, which is also up 4.6% for the year. Here we are budgeting a $4 million transfer towards the public works building construction. In our hospitality tax, we received $110,000 of revenue in July, which is down 10% over last year. Our expenses include a million dollars for the final BAC pledge payment, $50,000 for the subsidy for the Stark County Veterans Memorial, and $37,000 for the environmental assessment at the airport to upgrade the jet service. The occupancy tax, we received $62,000 of revenue in July, which is down 32% over last year. Our expenses include $189,000 paid to the CVB for their subsidy, $60,000 for the special events grant, a $5,000 subsidy to the Rough Rider Commission, and a $5,000 subsidy for the downtown revitalization contract. Our street projects report, we received $250,000 of revenue, and we've expended $990,000 towards those projects through July. And in our development impact fee program, this program has a balance of $106,000 at the end of July. Uh, just to note, we have $1.2 million in projects yet to be reimbursed. Those are some of the highlights. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. Are there any questions? Is there a motion to approve the report as presented then? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Mr. Altman's. Aye. Mrs. Dukart. Aye. The chair votes aye. The motion carries. Item B is a water reclamation facility engineering services agreement. Uh, Mr. Colling, are you explaining this? I am, Mr. President, Commissioners. The proposed agreement before you is an agreement with Ronnie Engineering. Uh, this agreement pertains to the water reclamation facility uh, that is currently being constructed. As you know, uh, the property currently is outside of city limits, and uh, the city is interested in having that uh, parcel of property platted and uh, possibly incorporated into city limits and annexed in. Uh, Ronnie Engineering would do the engineering work on that for us to uh, create the plat and work with us on the, um, the annexation, uh, creating the boundaries for the annexation parcel. Uh, the agreement um, has a not to exceed uh, compensation number. Um, the anticipated compensation for this agreement would be $18,000. And city staff recommend approval, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Colling. Uh, are there any comments or questions by uh, the commission? Not. Is there a motion uh, regarding the approval of this agreement? I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. We have the motion, the second. Any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, we'll vote. Mrs. Stuckart. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Altman. Aye. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Chair votes aye. So the motion carries. Item C is a right of way agreement. Uh, and again, Mr. Colling, your presentation. Yes, Mr. President, Commissioners, the uh, agreements in front of you pertain to the construction of 10th Avenue West. Uh, this is an urban roads pro project. Uh, the city anticipates uh, receiving approximately $1.2 million uh, for uh, the federal government's cost participation in this uh, construction of this road. In order to construct the road, uh, the city is required to um, acquire the necessary right-of-way and temporary construction easements. Um, some of this right-of-way was dedicated uh, with the platting of the Cook Meadow Hills subdivision, uh, but all of the right-of-way uh, to the south of Cook Meadow Hills and on the east side of uh, the 10th Avenue, uh, center line of, of 10th Avenue, um, has not been uh, acquired. Uh, so this, uh, these agreements would allow for the acquisition of that right-of-way. Uh, there are two developed properties there, uh, both residential properties on the uh, west side of 10th Avenue. And um, this agreement uh, is with one of those property owners. There is an identical uh, agreement, which I see did not make it into your packets, um, but it would be with the other property owner. Uh, in some total, uh, the city would acquire uh, the right-of-way and temporary construction easements uh, for a little less than $60,000. Um, ordinarily, when um, 
when a property owners plat their property, this right of way is dedicated. Uh, however, these property owners are already developed properties and have no intention or desire to have their properties platted. Uh, therefore, the city would need to acquire that right of way uh, pursuant to these agreements. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if you have them. Thank you, Mr. Colling. Are there any questions by the commission? If not, is there a motion regarding the approval of this agreement? Move to approve. Second. So we have a second. Any <coughs> other discussion? Hearing none, then uh, we'll vote. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Mr. Stuckart. Aye. Mr. Oldman. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Chair votes aye. So the motion carries. That brings us to item D, reports. Uh, that would be Mr. Kessel. President Johnson, uh, the Mid-Continent Communications Agreement, uh, uh, Mr. Colling is going to go over that one as well. Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, this uh, letter from Mid-Continent Communications is um, intended just for your information. Uh, Mid-Continent has uh, contacted the city and has indicated their interest in acquiring a cable television franchise. Um, they will be presenting uh, a formal franchise agreement in the next uh, meeting or two and uh, desiring to operate a cable television franchise within the city of Dickinson. Uh, our current franchise for cable television uh, is a non-exclusive franchise, as all of our franchises are. Uh, if other operators wish to operate a franchise within the right-of-way of the city of Dickinson, they can do so uh, under the same terms as the current franchisee. Uh, so uh, there is no action that is required at this point. However, uh, it is in there for your information that we may be bringing a franchise ordinance uh, before you in the next meeting or two. Mr. Colin, uh, so Mid-Continent will have to offer their services throughout the community, not just the, the new property? Or that's the same agreement we have with Salt. Yes, that's correct, Commissioner Steiner. The way the franchise uh, process works and the agreements work, uh, the service has to be offered throughout the city under the same terms, at least as far as the city is concerned, the same terms offer the use of our right-of-way and other facilities. Yeah, thank you. So, Mr. Colley, that just simply <coughs> means that citizens will have a choice of cable providers? Correct. Correct. There will be, if this uh, franchise is approved, there will be two cable providers within the city then? Um, they're not required to offer those services at the same price? No, that's correct. They uh, can do whatever they want there? Correct. Uh, their terms from the city, as far as what the city would require, would be more or less identical. Uh, but the commercial terms at which they want to offer those services to the public, uh, they can do to do so at whatever uh, market rates they want to. And do they have to offer the same set of services, uh, for example, internet, wireless, that that kind of thing? No, they do not. And uh, from what we know from Mid-Continent at this point, uh, their interest is only in offering offering the cable television service, okay. uh, not the other ones that Consolidated may offer. <clears throat> Mr. Colling, are there, um, are there franchise fees or anything else like that involved, either to the city or to the state? or? Uh, there are franchise fees that, that may apply. Uh, we do uh, collect a, a small franchise fee for cable television. The other franchise fees or the franchisees that we have in the city uh, do not pay a franchise fee at this point. Uh, we reserve the right in our franchise agreements to assess a franchise fee, but at present, those other franchises do not pay a fee. Thank you. President Johnson, uh, one additional uh, item. I did speak with the representative from Mid-Continent Cable today, and it is their intention to package, provide a package that will include video um, or cable uh, voice and data. Um, it may not be at this exact same time, but that is their intention long term, is to offer uh, package deals. Uh, the franchise is not s made subject uh, to the data and voice, um, but only to the uh, cable portion. Move on to the next item. I think so. Thank you. The next item is the hiring journal. and. Uh, Shelly Namak is here to provide that to you. Good 
Good evening, Mr. President, Commissioners. We have a few updates, I guess, to this um, journal since I printed this off for all of you. Uh, water utility operator, as you see, we've had some troubles filling this, but it is filled now. We have hired the water utility operator. Street maintenance operator, we did fill one in July, lost another one, so we still have three openings. Um, that position just closed and we'll start doing interviewing um, for that next week. The street and fleet operations manager closes this Friday. Um, so interviews for that probably in the next couple weeks. Uh, sanitation operator, we uh, did fill two positions um, for that and that is completely filled. Don't have any openings for operator at this time in sanitation. Sanitation laborer, we just actually did interviews today and um, we'll make a decision on who we may offer a position there. The chief sanitation operator was a new position for 2013. We did um, interview and filled that one. And then we lost our current chief sanitation operator. So that position opened again and just closed on Friday and we'll be um, scheduling interviews for that position. Assistant City Engineer, we um, went through a round of interviews and um, reopened the position and that one will close on September 2nd. City Forester, um, since I printed this out, um, we did hire, um, I made an offer and he accepted for City Forester. <coughs> so that has been filled. Police officer, um, we will be doing interviews this week. We have two openings yet in, for police officer. And then we have a library director position open. Any questions? How does the uh, labor market seem to you today compared to say three to six months ago? <coughs> Um, you know, I think the same positions are have been difficult to fill since I've been here the last year and a half. You know, the operator positions were still having a very difficult time filling. Um, police officer positions as well. Um, the some of the administrative positions um, we've been getting a, a great uh, number of applicants, very good numbers, which is nice. The laborer for sanitation, um, that laborer position, we got 10 applicants. Um, however, not all of them showed up for the interviews, but we did get a good number for that one. It's the operators and police officers we continue to struggle with. Okay. So it's it's kind of looking to me like maybe some of the the men that are moving here are probably starting to bring their families here. I'm starting to see some families applying, wives and um, children might be starting to move here. Okay, well that's good news. Yeah. All right, other comments or question? All right, thank, thank you. you. <coughs> Mr. Gessel? The last item that we have then is a Dakota Prairie Enrichment Center thank you note. Um, we, we get these uh, occasionally as it relates to uh, uh, dollars that we have provided to them for uh, our grant program, the Southwest Community Grant Program, and that's what this one is for, well, uh, thanking us for equipment that they purchased for, um, uh, it was a volleyball, basketball practices, things like that. So uh, they're, they're expressing their gratitude for the grant program. And that would conclude my reports. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kessel. Are there any comments or questions for Mr. Kessel? All right, well, we'll move to public safety and we'll hear from the Chief Sevok of the Fire Department. President Johnson and Commissioners, the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Personnel Grant, otherwise known as the SAFER Grant, is now open. The uh, grant period, the closing for the grant is the end of August. And uh, 
We have written this grant before, unsuccessfully. It is uh, to help us staff the department to adequate levels to ensure we have enough members on initial response <coughs> to effectively, positively impact the incident we're responding to. And uh, I would like your permission to again write the grant, the SAFER grant. It provides two years of salary and benefits for the positions hired with the city responsible for maintaining those employees one year after the grant period ends. We'd be asking for three firefighters in addition to what you've seen reflected in our 2014 budget request. So our, I'm before you tonight to ask for your approval to write the grant and go ahead and submit the application. Okay, thank you, Chief. Are there any comments or questions? Yeah. Chief, uh, when was the last time we applied for that grant? The last grant period, last, last year. Last year, and mm -hmm. we were denied. We were denied. It's an extremely competitive grant process nationwide. A uh, federal grant that, again, doesn't have enough funding to take care of all the needs. And again, this year, the sequester will impact it also. Um, but uh, it is just an extremely competitive process. Do you know what the amount is you're going to put in the grant at this time? Three firefighters' salary and benefits would uh, run by today's dollar amount without the pay scale change or anything. Uh, I am going to estimate $160,000 for all three. That's salary and benefits. That'd be one year. That's per year. And and this is a two-year grant. Is it? Two two years of that basic dollar amount would be covered by the grant. <coughs> Chief Sivak, this uh, grant um, requires then us to do fund one year after at a minimum, um, but it does not cover things like um, uniforms and op other operational equipment, correct? It does not. That's been reflected in, pr in increases in our 2014 budget. Any other comments or questions? Uh, if if uh, you're in favor of... Uh, the chief going ahead and doing this, we just, I think, simply need a motion to approve the submittal of the SAFER grant. I'd make that motion. I'll second. second. We have the motion and the second. Other discussion? Hearing none, uh, we'll vote. Mr. Ullman? Aye. Ms. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you. You're welcome. The uh, next item under public safety is the uh, DUI ordinance. Uh, Mr. Colleen, uh, any updates to that? Mr. President, uh, commissioners, just to review this ordinance, uh, this would uh, bring our city ordinances into compliance with uh, the recent state law changes in uh, driving under the influence penalties. In the main, uh, the ordinance raises the uh, penalty for a first DUI offense uh, from $250 to $500, and for a second offense within seven years, from $500 to $1,500. There are some other technical changes that are included within this uh, ordinance, uh, but all of them are intended to bring our city ordinance into compliance with the recent state law enactment. Uh, this ordinance is unchanged from first reading, and city staff recommend approval. Thank you for that introduction, Mr. Colling. This is ordinance number 1516. If there's anyone from the public that would like to comment uh, regarding this proposed ordinance, you may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, and we'd, we'll hear your comments. There's no one from the public that wishes to comment. Uh, any comments by or questions by commissioners? If not, would there be a motion regarding the second reading and final passage of Ordinance 1516? Mr. President, move to approve second reading and final passage of Ordinance 1516. Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Mr. Steiner. Ms. Aye. Mrs. Stuckert. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Altman. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. We'll move to engineering. Uh, and hear Mr. Watson's updates. Mr. President, Commission, tonight I would like to update the uh, State Avenue Railroad Crossing project. I have a, I have a short uh, PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> uh, 
uh, the whole idea of this railroad grade separation is to eliminate the signal and gates that you see here on this slide. Um, the next slide shows the impact area of the uh, railroad grade separation and the study area that is being considered uh, by uh, the DOT folks, uh, HDR consulting firm is doing this on behalf of the state. I uh, see the X in the middle there indicates where the, the crossing is itself. You can see that the impact area is, is uh, north of Ballard and extends uh, considerably south of the, of the Broadway intersection with uh, states as well as east-west of the uh, crossing itself. So the uh, next slide was, is, shows the uh, bridge profile over the railroad. Uh, the great separation will be a bridge over the railroad. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this slide, so I, I made it an additional slide. Uh, the next one shows a, a tighter view of this, uh, which indicates that the bottom of the State Avenue, uh, the bottom of the bridge itself will be 26 feet above the railroad uh, tracks. And that is pretty much standard throughout the industry for crossings over a railroad. Um, the bridge itself is three to five feet in in height, so the so the top of the pavement on the bridge would be about 30 feet above the existing railroad tracks. Um, the next slide shows the uh, first alignment that would be held on the State Avenue uh, alignment. In other words, the bridge would be built on the existing street alignment. You can see the various connections for the uh, Palm Beach Road and connection between Broadway and State and the intersection at uh, Villard. Um, some of the access points would have to necessarily be removed for the businesses on the northwest, including UPS, and there's a church there and, and uh, Pizza Hut's over there. Um, but that's still in uh, consideration as part of the access uh, study. The, uh, it's kind of hard to see in this slide, but it's kind of small, but it's kind of necessarily necessary to get everything involved in the slide. The next slide shows that the same basic bridge only on an offset alignment. Um, the advantage to this alignment is that it allows the bridge it, to be constructed while State Avenue remains open at the at grade crossing. Uh, the other previous alignment with the bridge on the State Avenue alignment would require the, the, the road to be closed while during construction. This would be, uh, this alignment would be uh, better for the city in that the State Avenue would, be, would remain open while the bridge is being constructed. Um, the next slide shows the, the typical sections that are being considered for State Avenue itself. The road is uh, 64 feet wide, four-lane uh, facility with a with two-way left turn lane uh, on top. The bottom uh, section, uh, the re revised principal arterial section shows a, a median uh, at the intersection of Broadway and at Ballard. The next slide shows the, uh, that the bridge itself, the State Avenue Bridge, will go over Broadway. So there will be no intersection with Broadway, and therefore you can see the, uh, the connection of uh, this road here would, would connect State Avenue back to Broadway. 
um, and the purple road up here would show the shows and access to uh, Broadway from Palm Beach Road. The next slide shows uh, various access points from Palm Beach Road. And again, these are all being uh, studied and uh, considered by the DOT and through their consultant HDR consulting. So the um, project schedule shown on the next slide uh, is the uh, preliminary engineering will be completed in September of this year. Uh, the final design will start then and run through the end of the year and we expect it, the construction of the railroad grade separation to begin in 2014 and possibly uh, part of 2015. These things are difficult to to determine uh, based on the uh, construction season here in the north part of the country. So it just depends on how many days we get to build. So the next slide shows that we have a public input meeting here in this room tomorrow night, Tuesday, August 20th, from 5 to 7 p.m. And there'll be a presentation made by DOT and their consulting engineer at 6 p.m. So we certainly want to invite all the public to share in that public input meeting tomorrow night here in the commission room uh, so they can have some input on to, into some of the connections to the streets and so forth um, tomorrow evening. So again, we invite the public to attend this, this important public input meeting on the uh, railroad grade separation on State Avenue tomorrow night here in the commission room from 5 to 7. Thank so you, Mr. Austin, President. How, how have we been able to get this out to the public? We done? Is there any prior notice been put out? Yes, there's uh, there's a specific process that's that is mandatorily mandatorily followed by the DOT, and the, there's been advertisements in the paper and and in other forms of the media. So. Um, there have been notices out there in the public already, but I, I wanted to take this opportunity during this meeting to uh, share this uh, advertisement, I guess, with the public so that we could get as much input from, from the folks out there as we could. Thank you. President? Thank you, Mr. Watson. Uh, any other comments or questions regarding the uh States Avenue, uh, I guess, overpass now. All right. Well, thank you for the update. Um, we have. Uh, do you have other projects you wish to comment on? I really haven't had time to prepare too much, other than making this presentation. I can update you that uh, the Tenth Avenue West project has been moved. Uh, the bid date for that has been moved up and will be let by DOT in October rather than in November. And we are uh, closing on the right-of-way acquisition as Mr. Coling indicated before and you voted on earlier. And um, we anticipate that that project will go out to bid in October. Okay. Anything else? Then uh, we have a five o'clock uh, timetable agenda item. This is uh, an engineering presentation by Mike Berg. Um, Mr. Watson, do you have anything you'd like to add in terms of an introduction here? Uh, Mike is our uh, sanitary sewer consultant that we have on board. He does much of the modeling here in the city for, uh, in fact, all the wa all the sewer lines that we have. So. Uh, I'm not sure what this first present is. This first presentation on the influent pump station. Yes. So this influent pump station is actually part of the water treatment facility that's currently under construction. And without this influent pump station, the uh, the treatment plant just doesn't work. So Mike knows more about this than probably anybody here. So I'm sure he can fill us all in. Okay. Well, welcome, Mr. Berg. Thank you, President Johnson, members of the City Commission. 
Um, a brief summary of the Influent Pump Station. This uh, project bid two weeks ago. Uh, bids came in around where expected. And uh, for the presentation tonight, I'll go over just the project need, um, description of facilities, and a rough schedule. Project need. This map is the same map that's in the comprehensive plan that's posted on the city's website. There's been some minor route adjustments in the last nine months, but essentially all the projects are the same. Uh, just to give an overview, in general for the city of Dickinson, wastewater flows south and east to a point by the livestock yards where currently it turns and heads east to the existing ponds. A part of the strategy to deal with future growth in the city of Dickinson is to take some of the wastewater flow north of interstate and direct it to the west. From there, we're collecting flows and directing them to the east. We'll also be picking up flows in South Dickinson. Um, these flows will go to the new Influent pump station, which is this project uh, that I'm giving the overview on. It's also the project that was in the consent agenda for uh, approval this, this evening. To provide a close-up of this project, this project is a lift station located at node S2. It will receive wastewater from the existing City of Dickinson flows. We'll have a gravity sewer that's 30 inches in diameter that will flow south to the lift station. We'll also receive flows from West Dickinson. From this point, it will pump uh, east across the Hart River, south of the existing ponds, and along 8th Street southeast to the new wastewater treatment facility, or the water reclamation facility. So the gravity sewer is one third mile of 36 inch PVC. Uh, one um, interesting item on this pump station is that it's designed so that if the pump station goes down, we can back up into the existing ponds. Um, during this whole process, we've retained the existing ponds, and uh, they will shave peaks and uh, provide a backup for existing systems. The pump station is a triplex station with a firm capacity of 15 million gallons per day, or 10,400 gallons per minute. It's a wet pit, dry pit station, and what that means is that Operation staff can maintain these pumps without pulling them out of the station. They can maintain them in place. They're 380 horsepower and weigh about 6,000 pounds. So being able to maintain them without pulling them um, is a big advantage for, for operation staff. We have a mechanical screen. Um, the main purpose of the mechanical screen is there, there are a lot of brick manholes throughout the old parts of town, and occasionally bricks and, and Parts of bricks will make their way down to the existing uh, pumping or, uh, treatment facilities. This mechanical screen will pull those brick chunks out of there and uh, we'll get those in a dumpster and pulled out. Also, odor control, and then the building is precast concrete. I'll just give you a rough idea of how water flows through here. All the wastewater will come into this outer bay. It will flow through a gate into the pump inlet bay. From here it goes up the pump suction. Here's the pump, which is about six and a half feet tall, weighs 6,000 pounds. From there it will pump out the building. Uh, we have an overhead bridge crane that uh, allows equipment to be pulled and uh, we can deliver that to a vehicle. When we look at the ground floor, we have the wastewater coming in from this direction flows through a screen. We'll take a right turn into those bays we looked at previously. We'll be pumped through the pumps and out the station. Exterior of the building is precast concrete. Uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of these types of buildings recently. Um, very economical, and the contractors like them because they go up quick without a lot of work in the field. Force main is two and a half miles, 24 inch PVC. Uh, we've tested the soils quite a bit out at the treatment plant. We'll use predominantly native soils for bedding that pipe. Um, 
one issue of concern as we as we go across country is rock and um, there's a lot of different ways you can handle rock encountered on a force main project on this particular project uh, the decision was made to handle rock as it's encountered um, by change orders oh, deep. Uh, most of the line is eight eight feet deep. There's a few places where we get as deep as 15. And we did hit rock at the water reclamation facility about 20 feet deep. So. Um, award of contract was this evening. Substantial completion is June 6th of next year. So it's a very aggressive schedule with final completion October 31st of next year. A uh, substantial completion is when the facility is ready for its intended use, uh, pumping water to the water reclamation facility. And that's the summary of the influent pump station. Are there any questions? Any, any comments or questions? You know, thank you for that presentation. That, uh, I think, it's very good. That gives, uh, I think, the Commission a good understanding of, of uh, just how large and how sophisticated that project really is. I mean, when you talk about a $10 million budget for a pump station, it seems like a pretty large amount, but uh, which it is. But I can see that uh, this is a fairly complex and sophisticated system here. So. Thank you. You uh, did a good job explaining it. Thank you. Mr. President. Didn't you think he did a good job, I think Bill? he did a fantastic oh, okay. job. <laughs> and uh, uh, his next presentation will even be better. Oh, is there another one? Yes, there is. Oh, OK. The uh, next presentation is on the West Lift Station, uh, which will pump into this last influent pump station from the west and actually will carry all the water, all the uh, wastewater coming from the diesel topping plant as well as from the northwest part of the city. And again, Mike knows more about this than anyone, so he'll be doing the presentation. Okay, I'll get out of your way. Okay. Um, the West Pump Station and Force Main Project is the next project on this wastewater conveyance and collection system. Uh, the decision was made recently to pursue state revolving fund funding for this project and as part of that funding a public hearing is required and um, also we will be submitting a facility plan and having a, a comment period with the department of health so that's the main purpose of this presentation um, the state revolving fund amount has been secured and it will be available march of next year if we need money for this project earlier, uh, we, we can pursue that. Uh, we'll require some additional communications with the Department of Health and, uh, and the EPA. So uh, this presentation outline is defined by um, the funding requirements on this project. Again, project need, facility siting, proposed facility, we'll have an estimate of costs and schedule. We, this is the same figure that we looked at previously. The West Pump Station is located at the intersection of Old Highway 10 and the West Business Loop. It will receive flow from North and West Dickinson. Um, will also receive flow from South Hart and the Dakota Prairie Refinery. It will pump this flow south and east to the new Influent Pump Station. So the project need is to accommodate expected growth in the city of Dickinson. Close up on the siting, um, we follow, uh, it's in the corner of Highway 10 and, and the West Business Loop. We follow Villard. We cut across the commercial industrial area where the old refinery used to be. We go around the bypass location that the Department of Transportation is working on south on state and then we'll head east on fifth street south uh, the west gravity sewer is a separate project that will feed this pump station this is will be 4700 linear feet of 30 inch pipe 
that will deliver water through this pump station. The West Pump Station, again, it's a triplex station, wet pit, dry pit design. The pumps are approximately 300 horsepower. This is a self-cleaning wet well, so um, designed to so that operation staff don't have to get in there and clean it. We have a firm capacity of 8.6 MGD, which is 6,000 6, gallons a minute. Um, for reference, this is approximately the entire flow of the city of Dickinson now, peak flow. Uh, this station will also include vapor and liquid phase odor control. So looking at this station from the side, wastewater will come in through the pipe here. We flow down this ramp, and then we have suction inlets here for the three pumps. If we look on the other direction, uh, we see the wastewater is coming in through the influent pipe here. We have a very narrow trench. We'll flow down into these pump inlets. Uh, the pump isn't actually shown, but you see an outline of a six-foot-tall person here, and will be pumped out of the building. Again, overhead hoist or bridge crane to remove equipment. Looking from the plan level, we have odor control equipment. This is liquid phase chemical that will be added to the wastewater. Prevent odors and also prevent corrosion or minimize corrosion in your collection system. And here's the rendering of the precast building. Um, low maintenance is uh, a design criteria for the projects we're working on. Also natural light and uh, access for equipment. This is a hatch over those chem feed tanks so they can be removed in the future. Force main is 3.3 miles of 20 inch PVC force main. Again, predominantly native soils or pipe bedding. And this force main is planned to uh, lay a gravity sewer between two of the existing lift stations to allow one of them to be decommissioned in the future. Lift station four, right on Highway 22 south of the Hart River, has been the cause for some backups recently. As part of this project, since we're going down Fifth Street, we're planning to lay a gravity sewer from lift station four to lift station five. One of the future projects for the next biennium is to upgrade lift station five, and at that point, lift station four will be decommissioned. Lift station five will pump all the flow from South Dickinson through this existing force main. As part of this project, we took soil borings, uh, 12 soil borings from the intersection of the West Business Loop 994 all the way over to where the livestock yards are. Uh, no rock was encountered, but we did encounter patrolling motors in four of the soil borings. Uh, first one was up near the, the exit at I-94. We also encountered patrolling motors on the Hart River, on State, and over on the east end of the project, again, when we cross the Hart River. Uh, Department of Health is notified. They're aware of it. It didn't cause a lot of concern with the Department of Health. Petroleum motors can come from a lot of different sources when we're um, in coal country, but it's just something we'll have to monitor. Planning level costs, these are the costs that were submitted to the state for funding. Construction costs of 13 million. Um, design costs of 1.39 million. And construction management costs of 0.9 million. Uh, those are budgets. These uh, task orders have actually been approved, and uh, the, uh, the expected amounts is lower than what's shown here. Total project budget is $15,468,000. A $7 million grant has been secured from an energy impact grant, which leaves approximately $8.5 million for city funding. And this has been secured with the state revolving fund. Uh, potential revenue sources in oil impact grants, which has been secured. Um, 
Traditional revenue sources are user fees and special assessments, um, equitable revenue sources from permanent, new, and temporary users, infrastructure sales tax, uh, sewer access charges, and the like. Environmental impacts of this project, improved collection system operation and capacity, uh, reduce potential for bypasses, and promote regionalization of wastewater infrastructure. Tentative schedule, it's tentative because this is dependent on the funding constraints and some easement issues we're dealing with. Um, the final completion is going to be next or the substantial completion is going to be October of 2014 regardless. Uh, that's the date that the Dakota Prairie Refinery is scheduled to come online and this facility will receive wastewater from the refinery. Um, the initial dates on here are dependent on the items I mentioned. Advertise for bids September, open bids in October, award contract in November and notice to proceed in November. And that completes this presentation. Well, thank you, Mike. That was even better than the first one. <laughs> so at this time, then, the, uh, the thing to do is to declare the public hearing open and allow comment from the public regarding uh, this Westliff Station uh, project. So we'll declare the public hearing open, and if you wish to comment, just come to the podium, state your name, and we'll hear your comments. Is there anybody from the public? There's no one from the public, so we'll declare the public hearing closed. Uh, is there any other action required by the commission? No. Okay. One question of Mr. Berg, the dollar figures you're showing us tonight, Mike, reasonably close to what our CIP, CIP has been showing for that project? The uh, reasonably close, um, but the lift station five and lift station four, that decommissioning, that pipeline has been wrapped into this, and there's some additional dollars in there for increasing the pipeline size. So um, I have detailed cost estimates. If you'd like to, uh, I can provide those. I just ask so that our staff can keep up with any CIP changes that we need to do if it's appreciable. Mr. Berg, as you're um, going along State and Fifth, um, what kind of dis disruption can the public expect? You're going to go under the streets, and so will the streets be torn up, or, or what's the approach there? Um, for quite a bit of Fifth Street, west of Highway 22, that street will be replaced curb to curb in sections. So there will be some disruptions for residents along that street. We typically require that the contractor allow access for each resident in the evening, which might mean uh, they can only do uh, certain portions at a time. There will be some construction uh, traffic planning uh, along with that project. Um, for most of the rest of the route, East of Highway 22 along 5th, uh, we aren't going across the entire roadway, so access will be maintained in that area, or it's expected to be maintained. Okay. How about on state? Um, we don't expect any interruptions on state. We'll be traveling along the west ditch uh, along the right of way. All right. That area is uh, right where the um <clears throat> Excuse me, where the grade separation is going to be, so there's likely to be a whole bunch of disruption disruption in that area. But not from this. But <laughs> probably not from this. But in conjunction, it might be. Okay. So, um, well, either Mike or Mr. Watson, you can ask. So on State, you're going to go Fifth Street and then go straight uh, through the area where there isn't a road right now because it turns onto Eighth Avenue. So, okay, so yes. then you go continue on straight all yeah. the way over. Yeah. On the south side of Fifth Street? Um, when we're south of the baseball fields, we'll be on the south side of Fifth Street. Okay. And, and then when we cross over into the residential area, um, we are generally on the south side of the center of the road, okay. but um, we'll end up taking a lot of that road out. There's uh, along that stretch, there's existing 
AC water main, which is uh, whenever we uh, encounter that on different projects with all the clients, the decision is typically to remove that when you encounter it in a street. Um, prone to water breaks and a major uh, operation and maintenance item. So that'll be taken out on that street as well. So then, like now on, on from State Avenue on 5th Street till you turn, um, go under 8th, that is still septic, so they can tie in in 2014 then? Um, this area will all be pressurized flow, so we won't be able to tie into this pipeline really anywhere along okay. it. Um, lift station five, that upgrade will tie in, but that's probably a special case. What this project will do will be, it will free up existing capacity um, south of the river and uh, free up capacity um, in, in the west part of Dickinson. Because that one area is not developed yet. Do you know which one I'm talking about, Ed, right? Directly on the south side of Fifth Street where Lewis's and Seacrest are, that development is not. So then our final costs include the tearing up of the street, rebuilding it to city specifications. Everything has been included in the final bill. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and uh, the Dakota Prairie Refinery is aware of your schedule on this one? Yes. Okay. We're going to cut it close. Yes. <laughs> Pardon me? As we are with all the projects. Yeah, I know. All right, anything else for Mr. Berg? Well, very okay. good, thank you for the presentations. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move then to tab seven, public works, and there it's project updates also. Uh, well, we'll stay on this same uh, line of the influent pump station and the aggressive schedule. Uh, uh, on the consent agenda, as Mike said, we approved the uh, uh, bid for that, and we'll need to do the notice of award and the NT notice to proceed as, as soon as we can to get that out and going. Uh, along with that, another uh, um, project that will be starting will be that water main construction project on State Avenue, so that will be a, another uh, project that will be started soon, and that was approved also on the consent agenda tonight. Um, Along with the other projects that are going on, uh, everything seems to be on schedule. The uh, public works building, the water reclamation facility uh, are all on schedule. The tank painting, 4th Avenue tank has been painted. Uh, they just have some uh, uh, work to do on the building there, uh, recoding the siding of the building. Um, and uh, the water main replacement of Villard actually that project, uh, they're doing some, uh, going to start some work on 2nd Street West. So they'll hopefully finish that up soon. But uh, like you said, it's an aggressive schedule and we need to uh, continue uh, the course. Any questions for Mr. Zero? Okay. Then we'll move to tab eight, which is community development. Um, and I know we have some rezoning petitions there, and I think there are three of them that are all second reading, but uh, we'll turn it over to Mr. Curtin, and you can take us through those. Mr. President, commissioners, the uh, first uh, rezoning petition tonight is a rezoning petition from ag to general industrial. Uh, this is for the public works building uh, that's being that's under construction on the east side of town. This would bring the uh, site in conformance with the existing zoning and the surrounding land uses. The site will be accessed via Public Works Boulevard, and it is approximately uh, 25 acres. Uh, there are no changes from the first reading. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Katan. Uh, this is ordinance number 1517. If anyone from the public would like to comment, you may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, and we'd hear your comments. 
There's no one from the public that wishes to comment. Any comments or questions by city commissioners? I'll move we approve second reading of 1517. Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none will vote. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Allman. Aye. Mr. Steiner. Aye. Mr. Stuttgart. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The next uh, rezoning petition is from low density residential to community commercial. The site is located at the corner of the intersection of 10th Avenue East and I-94 Business Loop. It is approximately 2.21 acres. The Planning and Zoning Commission and city staff recommend approval with the two uh, recommended uh, conditions of approval. There are no changes from the first reading, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Curtin. Uh, this is ordinance number 1518. If there's anyone from the public that would like to comment, you may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, we'll hear your comments. I'm Josh House with uh, Come and Go Convenience Store. Uh, Mr. President and the Commissioners, um, I'm just here to uh, answer any questions that uh, any of you may have this evening. Any questions regarding the Come and Go Store? Perfect. I think we're good, thank, thank you. you. I'll make a motion to approve the second reading and final passage of Ordinance 1518. Do we have second. a second? Second. Uh, before we vote, was there anybody else from the public that wished to comment on that? Okay. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion here by the commissioners? Not. We'll vote. Uh, Mrs. Stuckert? Aye. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Ullman? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Mr. President, the uh, next rezoning petition is uh, for multiple zoning districts to rural residential, general commercial, Limited industrial and general industrial. The site is located to the east of Highway 22 and to the south of 32nd Street Southwest in the city's extraterritorial zone. Uh, it is currently undeveloped and city staff uh, recommends approval. There are no changes from the first reading. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Catan. We have uh, Ordinance 1519. If there's anyone from the public that would like to comment regarding 1519, you may do so now. Just step to the podium, state your name, we'll hear your comments. Anybody wish to comment on 1519? No comments there from the public. Uh, any comments or questions by city commissioners? Would there be a motion regarding 1519? Move to approve. Second. We have the motion and the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, then uh, we'll vote. Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Stuckart? Aye. Mr. Ullman? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Chair votes aye. So the motion carries. Uh, we'll let you continue on, Mr. Curtin, with your reports. Uh, Mr. President, I wanted to bring to your attention a problem that is uh, starting to face our department uh, and the community in general. Uh, over the past several years, uh, I'm sure you have noticed that we've had a proliferation of uh, fences. You know, that's good in one behalf, uh, bad in another. Uh, attached in your uh, packet materials is a, a memo from me outlining the uh, current situation, the problems that we're uh, dealing with, and some possible remedies to correct that. Essentially, what we're having are many fences that are being installed at uh, at uh, corner properties, not the side properties that are in the middle of the block, that are being installed improperly, uh, that are not uh, following or not being consistent with the current fence regulations. Uh, specifically, um, at corner lots, you have two front, you have two streets. Uh, the garage or the front entrance to the residence would be required to be set back 25 feet if you want to keep it at six feet high, or and then also, if you have um, front yard setback, the other street is considered the street side, street, uh, side setback. And that, if you want to keep it at six feet high, which uh, is normally what most people want to do to have uniformity and uh, privacy, that would need to be set back 15 feet. Unfortunately, without the fence permit and the proliferation of fences that we've had, Many people are installing the fences along the secondary street at the at or adjacent to the sidewalk, which is uh, inconsistent to our setback standards. The reason that we have the setback standard is to 
protect the view corridor for motorists that are at that stop sign. When you are at an intersection and you're looking to your left or right, you want to be able to see cars coming both ways. And if we have fences that are too close to that, that are at six feet high, which is normally above your elevation, your side elevation when you're sitting in the vehicle, it obstructs your view corridor and uh, could possibly be a safety issue. This is also true for pedestrians as well. So over the last couple of years, uh, we've had a proliferation of uh, these fences. Uh, many of them you can see in the new state's edition, Painted Canyon and other subdivisions that we have. Um, what I'm proposing tonight is to uh, establish a fence permit. This would require the property owner or the fence company to come to the city, show us on a very simple site plan where they're going to locate the fence so that they could be, uh, so that we could permit it and ensure that it's going to be, that it's going to meet our current setback standards. Without a fence permit, unfortunately, many people are looking at our code that either we do not have fence regulations or they're just unaware of what our fence regulations are and erecting them to, uh, uh, contrary to our established code. Uh, the second uh, recommendation would be to uh, enforce, enforce our code. Uh, right now, as I've mentioned to you, many of those fences are put along the sidewalks, which unfortunately on many of the properties are located within our city right away in addition to not meeting our setback standard. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in addition to that, I would like to uh, bring up the question of if you, if you uh, grant uh, staff the ability to move forward with a fence permit, how should we address the existing fences? And since um, uh, just a rough number looking at the fences around the city, it appears to me that we could have up to 100 fences that are not in compliant, uh, I would recommend that we would establish a fence uh, program, uh, require a permit, enforce the regulations, and then in essence uh, not require the existing fences that are out there either put up uh, out of ignorance or just unknowing of the code um, not to enforce them to meet the current standard. Uh, whenever those fences are either upgraded or damaged in some way and they have to require a permit, then at that time they would have to be required to meet our, our current regulations. So that's what I'm proposing tonight and I'm bringing it to your attention. I'm open for uh, discussion and any insight that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Kirtan. Uh, any reaction by commissioners to uh, the issue regarding uh, residential fences? Well, depending where they are, are they um, like on a cul-de-sac or frontage on a street? Because those are the uh, Commissioner Ducar. The, the ones that are on the corner lots are the problems, not the ones that are middle block, where they're set back just uh, normally from their front facade along the sides and the rear. It's the corner residential lots where you have two road frontages are the problems. Uh, because at that point, uh, the biggest problem is the view corridor whenever you come up to that intersection. And uh, there, are certain air, there are certain intersections that uh, the main problematic ones are the ones where you have a curved road. And if you're on the, and if you're on the downward side of that curve, that fence is is protruding out and it's very difficult for you to see the traffic that would be coming to your left let's say or your right and it uh, could potentially cause an accident so could we have two because i know in a lot of our residents have large dogs and they're going to certainly jump over a four-foot fence so if we had specific areas where they can't have anything taller than a four-foot fence if they have an animal, they just can't buy that house or whatever. What they would do is they just they would have to push it back. Right. And many of your fences throughout the city do that. I mean, you could drive you could drive around and you could see on corner lots that that fence is pushed back the 15 feet. We have plenty of examples of it, but unfortunately, we have plenty of examples of people that are non-compliant mm -hmm. and the pro <coughs> and the problems that are associated with that. Do you think it is more of the do-it-yourselfers versus the fence contractors, or is it proliferated among both? 
Unfortunately, I'd have Hard to say to it's proliferated between both. Um, I've talked to some fence companies, and they will come to a, they will talk to the property owner. Uh, they know the regulations, and they will say, "No, I've got to push you back 15 feet." And the property owner will insist to put it next to the sidewalk because uh, several other people in their neighborhood has the same fence, and they feel that they should be uh, they should be granted the same privilege as the other people. And that's why I'm bringing it to your attention because we have so many around in in our newer neighborhoods and throughout the city that it's coming to a point in which many people are presuming that that must be the regulations therefore I could do that mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to stop because to put up a fence may only take a couple of days to do that our our inspectors if we see a fence going up that's contrary to code we stop and uh, let the contractor know the property owner that they need to push it back or they could apply for a variance you know give them the alternatives to that but it's very difficult to do because it's very it, it's tough to see the drive by and actually see them installing it sure. mr. Catan of, of the hundred or so fences you think are up how many of those would you estimate are in the new developments in the last couple of years I would say at least 30% uh, of them when you drive around the newer portion of states uh, state addition uh, most of the intersections now have the side obscuring the, the nice vinyl fences uh, and then also there are portions as you've seen in your packet materials of uh, of painted canyon as well all it takes is one or two people to put that and somebody else driving by go hey that's must be fine because the city hasn't done anything about it and then all of a sudden you have three or four or five pop up because they see that as an example but wouldn't wouldn't we be expected to side on the uh on the side of safety public safety that's why I'm bringing it to your attention tonight I would agree um, you can make a point that if somebody stops at an intersection and kind of pushes their car a little bit forward that uh, that they should be able to see well the intent of our clear view triangle ordinance that we have in other sections of the code is to make it so that at intersections when you look left or right there's a there's a an X number of feet that you could see so that if you have a car that's maybe speeding that's not going your normal 25 miles an hour that you would have enough time to react and either decide to get out quicker or to stop and that's also true for pedestrians as well it's a safety issue and also it's an aesthetic issue as well if you have fences that are located along your major roads at intersections at every single intersection over a period of time that becomes a wall effect and uh, you don't see the openness as you normally would have in a residential neighborhood so you have two issues uh, with respect to the regulations so the setbacks what you could still have the taller fence with the setbacks yes our, our current regulation allows uh, which I think is a pretty high fence you could have it at four feet high however you know when you have the the front part let's say if you put the fence next to your facade where your driveway in your front of your house sits that's normally going to be at six feet and then all of a sudden you have to bring it down the four feet a lot of people don't like that uniformity they, I mean the the difference in elevation of it they prefer the uniformity so uh, so they they try to um, install or want to install a six-foot fence I understand that it's just that the the code requires it to be pushed back 15 feet and the question is how do we want to address it from today forward and just to uh, let the Commission know the the fence permit that I'm proposing is going to be very simple fill out fill out the application very basic information you could come to the front counter and then show us a very rough if you want to use the term uh, site plan then in essence shows that you meet our setbacks and then it's left up to the property owner to install it correctly the key on that is I think the majority of fences that are installed are just misperceptions they they see others and they think I should be able to do the same and they go ahead and erect that fence uh, if they came in and required to get a very quick and easy fence that can be issued at the front counter then I think we can correct the vast majority of the problems that we do face today well and I guess I appreciate the fact that 
not trying to go in and correct the past. Um, it, it's a moving forward point is where you're trying to establish. That is correct. Most of the homes have the fences from where the house starts and goes back, but I can see where the new developments are changing. Mm -hmm. Newer developments, many of the people you know, are coming in with families, which is great for our community. And I've talked to, uh, this issue was brought up at the last Planning Commission, and I've talked to several people since then, and, and every person is, uh, that was opposed to keeping the existing code commented on that they wanted to have the privacy. You know, that additional two feet to them meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Some of them commented on that they have a bigger dog and they wanted to make sure that that would not jump, you know, jump over a four foot fence. And the other ones were talking about kids playing, you know, that additional two feet. If, the, if kids are playing in the backyard, playing with a ball, kicking a soccer ball, that might be the difference between a soccer ball going over, getting in the street, or, in the, or staying on the property itself. But we're not talking, the purpose of the conversation tonight isn't to necessarily debate our code, our standard. Uh, we're just talking about should we have a permit process to enforce it. That is my proposal tonight, correct. I have a couple questions for Attorney Colling, if, if I may. Sure. Um, the first one is, um, is the current and ensuing property owners at risk if the fence has been built in the right-of-way uh, if uh, we do uh, updates to that right-of-way that would require the fence to be moved who pays those expenses um, mr. Kessel in the event that the fence is constructed on the city owners or controlled right-of-way uh, that is city property and the fence would be uh, unlawfully or illegally installed and the property owner then would bear the cost of uh, relocating that fence so if the commission tonight um, decides to leave the fences that exist today in their current locations, does that then absolve the current property owner of those respon financial responsibilities? Or no, it, it would not. Uh, if, if the fence is located on city right away, it is installed at the property owner's risk, and the property owner would bear all costs to relocate that fence if it was required. Okay. Thank you. Other comments here um, any thought given to um, if a fence contractor installs a fence in violation of code that um, they could be assessed a penalty I mean you know even if an owner you know, tells them, no, here's where I want it. If the contractor can say, if I build it this way and the city discovers it, I'm going to be fined. Mm -hmm. uh, have you given that any thought? Uh, yes, I have. Actually, as part of our upcoming fee schedule, we had talked about um, that we're going to have several licenses, and one of them is a general contractor's license. And part of that general contractor's license would be if you are found uh, in violation of code, whatever the code may be, that we would have a penalty phase to it or a suspension or possible a revocation of that, uh, of that license. And that could be a way that uh, we could address an ongoing issue with a fence company. I mean, if I'm a, a, res or a property owner and I want to put a fence up and I contract a fence company, I'm going to assume that you know, they're professionals, they know what the codes are, and they're going to do it according to code. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I try to instruct them otherwise, they'll give me an education on what the code is. And, I mean, yeah, I think you have to kind of rely on them to police themselves. Correct. Um, well, the, w the requirement would be normally, I would feel, is that the uh, fence companies would come in and, and get the permit. And then part of that, we could have penalties that are associated with the uh, permit fee. I don't know if you know, a good idea or not. I'm just, you know, if there had been some discussion or thought regarding that, uh, I don't know how many fence companies city our size would have, but, you know, I think you, it's the same way when you go to a builder to build you a home, you assume that uh, they are 
they're going to build a code that they know all the specifics and you as the owner don't have to direct them on that. Um, yes, I would, I would agree and that's something that we could look into. I, my direction tonight is to see if, see if there is a uh, willingness from the city commission to, uh, to move forward with a fence permit and if so then, then we could address the uh, penalty portion for contractors and, and how we should address that accordingly. I, uh, I think that's a, that's a valid point for us to look into. I think we have to uh, proceed with the fence permit. It's just too much of a public safety situation if we continue it to go like it is. How we handle the ones that are <clears throat> have it now, I'm, I'm not so sure yet. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't require them to rebuild it down. I mean, it's still a public safety issue. And uh, like Mr. Jackson said tonight, we're just talking about it, the permit issue, but I think we have to have a, a good discussion about what we're going to do with the ones that are already there. And I just wanted to let the commission know that I'm, I definitely do not want to create additional work, you know, with our, with our workloads. However, I am looking at this permit to be one that can be issued at the counter. <coughs> Either a property owner or a contractor could come to the front desk fill it out at the counter, it'll be one page, very simple form. This is how I've done it everywhere I've been. And then the administrative staff who would normally take it in could look at the drawing, could easily see if it's in compliance, and then sign it off right there. So it's not going to be an additional cost, and not an additional cost, but a, a time uh, requirement or an additional burden to staff and uh, with, the, uh, with the amount of uh, uh, activity that we have, the development activity. So that's my intention for that. And, and you see it as a nominal fee, I think you mentioned in your memo, like $20? $20, $20, yes. Yeah. Okay. I guess I don't have a problem with you proceeding. And I plan on, I've already drafted up a letter, I plan on notifying all the fence companies and uh, putting it out as best I can to the public so they're aware of first of all the code and then also that they're required to get a fence permit give them a couple weeks before we implement that so that the uh, fence companies and uh, contractors in general could be aware of that you know mr Carton, if we could um if you could identify where some of the suppliers are you know like the menards or where people are buying their fencing supplies then we could get a letter out to those retail outlets where people are buying their fencing just so that you're a do-it-yourselfer and at least at the retail point we can make people aware that there's now a permitting process in Dickinson as well good point anything else for mr. Curtin just one thing that we mr. Curtin and I talked about um, another public safety thing about that property owners trees hanging over the street signs too I don't know if it's an issue that would cause an accident, but it's, they certainly do um, keep like 911 or whoever from seeing the street signs. And then also some of them are hanging over far enough where you can't, you have to pull out almost into the intersection to see around them. Your solution was? Well, the solution is I believe our current code requires that if the, tr the tree itself is located on your property, the, the trunk of the tree, then if it goes over the city right away, I believe it's the property owner in order to, to trim that. That being said, with our new forester, that could be one of the many items that uh, he patrols and, and keeps an idea on. Please let me know of uh, the areas that you see as a public issue, and uh, we can notify the uh, property owner that they need to trim that for for safety reasons. I have actually heard the same complaint, but it's for the overgrowth from the bushes onto the sidewalk. Uh, a couple of places in town, it's extreme, and the people walking have to actually, you know, if there's two of them, there's only room for one on the sidewalk. I think we probably know the area where I'm at, but, you know, uh, again, that's something that the forester, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, would have to do. Anything else on fences? Any other issues you have, Mr. Curtin? There's plenty of other issues, but uh, there's other nights for that, Mr. President. Thank you. Well, then we'll move on to item nine, which is uh, reports or issues by city commissioners. 
There are none. Uh, next item is item 10. If there's anyone from the public that would like to address the commission, you may do so now. Just come to the podium, state your name, and uh, we'll hear your comments. There's no one from the public. Chair to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have the motion and the second. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The motion carries. We're adjourned.